Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's AP bio chat. Um, my name is Lena. If you have any questions at all during the session, feel free to type them in the chat and I'll be paying attention to that as we go through the presentation. Um, today's little sort of mini lesson is broken into a couple of sections, same as last time. Um, the only difference is that today I decided to focus in on questions that I felt like had commonalities. Um, so we're going to be concentrating on like one specific topic today, and that topic is going to be DNA replication. I got a few questions about that, um, but we'll start with a little bit of just some background information. Uh, so first about our programming. Um, we're part of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, you can check us out online on our website. Um, you can also check us out on our social media pages. So you can get updates on programming like this. Uh, we're also doing some wet labs, science chats, um, et cetera. So feel free to check us out there. Um, so for the AP Biology exam this year, as I mentioned in our last session, uh, units one through six will be tested. Units seven and eight will be left out meaning that natural selection and ecology are not going to be tested this year. So you should focus your attention on units one through six. If this doesn't look like a familiar outline to you, um, this curriculum set is available for free online on the College Board's website. You can just look up AP Biology 2019 manual and a really big document will show up. Your teacher has probably shared this with you. It's like 200 pages long. Um, but you can go through unit by unit and for each unit uh, there are like sub objectives and they have nice one pagers that sort of summarize everything you need to know. Some logistics about the test. So what we still don't know um, is what type of free response questions you're going to see on your exam. We do know that it's going to be entirely free response. And as I said last week, uh, this past Tuesday, it's going to be um, a 45 minute long exam. We don't know how many questions you're going to get. We also don't know the full exam schedule just yet. Although College Board has announced that in light of COVID-19, each AP exam will be offered twice. We also don't know other details, like how is this test going to be kept fair? How is proctoring going to happen? Um, and the College Board says that they'll be updating you on things like this tomorrow. So check their website or their Twitter page for that. So I wanted to address like a question about the test. Um, so someone asked, will colleges accept AP scores even though the exam is different now? Uh, so yeah, it's pretty different, right? Like it's um, way shorter and also, uh, you know, it's only free response, the multiple choice and grid in sections have been eliminated. So this is from the College Board's website. It basically says that they in the past have done this sort of abbreviated exam for students facing emergencies um, and that colleges have accepted them. From my perspective, I would go through the exam that you're looking at and see which units are not being tested. If you feel like you know those units pretty well, um, then I would go ahead and say, like, if the college that you're applying to does give you credit, then maybe you can think about um, placing into the higher level course, but you should do what feels right for you. Like if you're missing two units of AP biology and you have no idea what evolutionary ecology are, um, maybe it wouldn't be a great idea to skip the intro level biology class. Right, so I think that from like a technical point of view, it seems like colleges will accept this abbreviated AP exam. I think from a personal point of view, um, you should think about your own situation and make a decision that's best for you. Someone asked uh, last, I think last session, I mentioned the four big ideas and I mentioned thinking about them as a strategy for answering free response questions. So uh, the four big ideas, uh, someone asked what they are. They are evolution. So the idea that living things change over time and the, the process of evolution leads to differences or diversity amongst organisms. But at the same time, um, you know, natural selection 
also selects for some things that we have in common, right? Uh, I don't imagine evolution is going to show up a ton on this exam because unit seven is no longer part of uh, your test. The next three big ideas are definitely going to be fair game. So metabolism is the idea that all living systems are going to require energy, right? And they're going to use energy to do various things. So building up and breaking down mo uh, molecules. The idea of heredity is one of the big ideas. So the sort of sharing of information between living things um, via these nucleic acids called DNA and RNA. Um, and then finally, the last big idea is that living systems are going to utilize complex pathways to interact with each other. And also on a molecular level, there are going to be interactions between your cells and the molecules in your cells that are vital to your survival. Okay. Um, and then these are the questions that I want to focus on for today. So two people asked, uh, one, can you explain DNA replication step-by-step? Step? I get really confused. And then a second person chimed in and said, what enzymes are involved in DNA replication? I always forget. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to to go through some diagrams with you, one, um, two, just like refresh on some concepts, and then three, um, give you some tips for studying, because I know replication is like one of the least favorite topics for AP Bio students, just because it seems like there are so many moving parts. Um, but I think by working with diagrams and animations, you can make your life a lot easier. So I've pulled this directly from that manual that I mentioned earlier. So replication is in unit six, it's 6.2, um, and the learning objective is to describe the mechanisms by which genetic information is copied for transmission between generations. That's a fancy way of saying we make copies of DNA. Um, so I put together this diagram. Um, so the sort of sub-essential knowledge, the first thing you need to know, and this is really important, if you like are taking notes or whatever right now, I would write this down, but if not, again, you can just reference that um, document that I mentioned earlier. So the first thing you need to know is that DNA is synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, and because a DNA strand is anti-parallel in nature, in other words, this sort of top strand is running from the five to three direction, this one is running from the three to five direction, what that means is that when synthesis occurs, it's going to proceed in opposite directions on each strand. Why is that the case? Um, that's the case because the enzyme that synthesizes new strands only works in one direction. It always works in the five prime to three prime direction. And if you remember what that enzyme is called, um, it is called DNA polymerase. Um, and so I've diagrammed this here on this top strand, um, the new synthesized DNA is going to be synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. And this can happen all in one swoop because there's nothing to stop it. Uh, this sort of strand is opening up and then you can sort of just add nucleotides in a constant manner. Um, the lagging strand, however, again, remember this enzyme only works in one direction. It can only work this way. Um, and so since this is sort of the end of the strand, right? you run into a problem, right? You run into a problem where you effectively have to work your way backwards, right? So you're working in the five to three prime direction, but you can only do it in tiny little chunks. And so you end up with synthesis that looks discontinuous, right? And when you learned about this process in more depth, you learned that the lagging strand synthesis is done by building these tiny fragments called Okazaki fragments, right? Okay, this was a pretty, I guess, broad overview of replication, but the main sort of essential knowledge here is that synthesis of the new strand will always happen in the five prime to three prime direction, okay? And that's just something you need to memorize. Okay, cool. Um, the next piece of essential knowledge is that replication is a semi-conservative process. If the word semi-conservative is like, uh, you know, intimidating to you, 
you can break it up into chunks, right? So the word semi or the prefix semi just means half, right? If you go to a semi-formal dance, uh, you, you wear like a, a kind of formal attire. You're not gonna wear like a floor length gown and a full tux. Um, conservative just means to save, right? So what this means is that each replication round, you're saving half of what you originally started with. Um, and so that is one strand of DNA serves as the template for a new strand of complementary DNA. And so this diagram here is showing you that if this double-stranded blue, so this, this is representing one DNA molecule, two strands, these are your template strands. After one round of replication, you split apart that two-stranded molecule, and I've uh, drawn in the newly synthesized DNA strands or the complementary strands in orange here. So you can see after one round of replication, each new daughter strand of DNA is half the original molecule and half a newly synthesized molecule. In other words, the original parent DNA strand was half conserved, right? Okay, just for you know, making sure you really get this, I drew out a second round of replication. So what would happen if we took these two new daughter strands and replicated them? Well, we would start by prying them apart, right? So we now would have four template strands, one blue one from here, one orange one from here, one orange one from here, and one blue one from here, right? Um, and so now our template strands are going to be taken from the original daughter strands. And then the newly synthesized uh, strands here are shown in yellow. So each of these second sort of generation uh, DNA replicates are semi-conserved from this first generation of daughter strands, right? Okay, cool. Um, I've gone through two essential knowledge pieces. Does anyone in the chat have questions right now? Um, while I have some time to take a look at the chat. Raghav is dabbing in the chat, okay. All right, let's keep moving. Um, so, I decided to put all of these essential knowledges on one page because I think that they sort of go through the steps. So going back to the original question, um, so going back to the original question, which was like, can you break down the step-by-step -step process? Uh, we always start again, just like, and when I think about molecular processes, I think about like what logically needs to happen, right? So if we have an original strand of DNA and we want to use each of those strands as our pattern or as our template, we need to make sure that they that they can be accessed, right? And so we can access them by pulling them apart. Um, okay, so the first thing that needs to happen is the DNA molecules need to be pulled apart, right? Um, and so the molecular player that's doing this is an enzyme called helicase, okay? Um, and this name comes from the fact that, you know, it's an enzyme that works on the double helix. Uh, your teacher probably showed you like the diagram. So the diagram that I showed you is really simple, right? So it's, uh, it's like this tiny little fragment, but we know that in eukaryotes, um, the, the DNA molecules that you're gonna be replicating are gonna be a lot bigger than that. And they're gonna be super coily, right? So if you've ever twisted together like your shoelaces or the strings on your hoodie, you know that when you twist them, it creates like a force and creates these really dense coils, right? So when the DNA is being unwound, there needs to be a mechanism to prevent those dense coils from, happen from happening, right? Because then you could break apart the DNA and that would be bad. Um, and so the enzyme that does that, it kind of alleviates the stress of that, that coiling action, the uncoiling action is something called topoisomerase. And that's kind of the scariest enzyme that you guys have to know for the AP. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just called topoisomerase and it relaxes the supercoiling from happening. DNA polymerase um, is going to be the enzyme. And if we think about the name, right? DNA polymer, ACE. Okay, ACE means it's an enzyme. DNA polymer means that it's probably an enzyme that's making DNA polymers, right? Um, so DNA polymerase is going to be the one that initiates DNA synthesis and sort of adds new nucleotides to the template strand. 
Um, something you do need to know for the AP is that this process requires something called primers. Um, a primer, prime means like first, right? So a primer is basically just the first sort of building block you need to get the ball rolling. And primers are added by an enzyme called RNA primase, right? So the names of the enzymes are kind of logical. Like if you, worst case scenario, if you forgot, you could, you, you know, you know that reactions require enzymes to happen. So you could infer that the enzyme that adds RNA primer is RNA primase um, in any case. Uh, once the primer is laid down, DNA polymerase is going to synthesize new strands of DNA. On the leading strand, as I discussed, this is going to happen continuously, right? Because there's nothing to stop it. Um, it's just following helicase, right? With the lagging strand, we're going to be synthesizing DNA discontinuously. And the reason for that is because remember, DNA polymerase only works in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, and so you're going to, kind of going to have to work forwards and then backtrack. If you've ever done sewing before, it's kind of like doing a back stitch. Um, okay. And then ligase. So going back to this diagram, right? You'll notice that when you're doing these little chunks of synthesized DNA, you're going to end up with gaps. Um, so there's actually another polymerase that fills in those gaps. And then you have another enzyme called a ligase that comes in and seals the new double strands together. So ligase is going to seal the new double strands together. Um, and then the exclusion statement from the AP. So you guys can read this, but the enzymes that I've listed here are the ones that you need to know. So on this slide. So you need to know DNA polymerase, you need to know ligase, you need to know RNA polymerase, you need to know helicase and topoisomerase. Um, but anything else, so like you don't need to know initiation is when RNA primer is added, right? Like you don't need to know the names of the steps, you just need to know what is happening and why it's happening and what enzymes are catalyzing that. But beyond these enzymes, you don't need to know anymore. Um, so any questions so far? No? OK. All right, so here is a diagram that I took from the textbook that I taught from when I taught AP Bio. So um, if you use Campbell, this is in your book. Um, this is just a more complex cartoon of what I showed you before. So again, we've got our parental DNA. Um, do we need to know the difference between DNA polymerase one and three? So on the old iteration of the AP exam, you definitely needed to know DNA Paul one and DNA Paul three. Um, for the purposes of this exam, no, you don't need to. Um, but for like while we're talking about it, Paul one is going to be the polymerase that fills in the gaps of the Okazaki fragments whereas polymerase three is going to be the one that is doing uh, the synthesis of the leading strand and also the synthesis of um, the chunks of DNA on the lagging strand. Good question, Linda. Um, so no, although, you know, it's good to know that there's two different ones. Um, thanks, JMCC. All right, so. Um, yeah, this is just a more complex cartoon. We can sort of see that the two molecules have been split apart. Helicase is working its way down this way, right? And then as the strands become exposed, right, DNA polymerase three is able to do its work up here. And you can sort of see why DNA polymerase is kind of able to just do this continuously. All it has to do is follow helicase, right? Um, DNA polymerase three on the lagging strand has to do a little bit more work. And notably, um, every time you make a new Okazaki fragment, primase actually has to come in and lay down a new primer. So that's important to know too. Um, okay, any questions about replication so far? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, and so what I would recommend you guys do um, is if you, you know, if you want, you could like take a screenshot of this. Also, the internet is a really good search tool. You could search for, a, you know, an unlabeled replication diagram like this and try and fill it in. But I think the more useful tool is for you to draw yourself your own little two-dimensional cartoon. 
Um, sometimes that can be a little bit daunting, especially since you can't see these diagrams moving. So I wanted to show you guys a resource that Cold Spring Harbor has. So you're on this YouTube page right now. If you um, went to the account, so the DNA Learning Center page, you'd be able to see playlists and there are playlists of a lot of these processes. So um, one of those is a video on replication and I'm not gonna play the whole thing because you can sort of look at this on your own time, um, but it does sort of give you- During DNA replication, both strands of the double helix act as templates for the formation of new DNA molecules. Like a three-dimensional overview. Copying occurs at a localized region called the replication fork, which is a Y-shaped structure where new DNA strands are synthesized by a multi-enzyme complex. Here, the DNA to be copied enters the complex from the left. One new strand is leaving at the top of frame, and the other new strand is leaving at the bottom. Okay. Um, and again, you know, you, you're more than welcome to check out these on our website. Um, but for the purposes of right now, I'm just going to keep moving along. So my recommendations, if you are studying replication, and honestly, these recommendations could also be used for any molecular process. So you have to know, like, what are some of the other molecular processes you guys need to know? Photosynthesis, right? That's a real pain. So is cell respiration, right? Um, all of these processes, I highly recommend doing this like series of things. So first is watching animations. There's something really useful about watching these molecules move in front of you. Um, the second thing that I would always have my students do is draw two dimensional cartoons and label the enzymes involved and also use arrows to show where things are moving. That's really important. Um, I think it's also useful to next to your little cartoons, write a table for yourself um, on one side of the like T chart have the enzyme names. And then on the other side, you can include like what they're doing, right? And then you can sort of quiz yourself if you want. This is extra. I think drawing the diagrams is better than doing the printed out unlabeled diagrams. Um, but you could quiz yourself by finding unlabeled diagrams and trying to fill them in. Um, and then, like I said before, try and focus on the logical sequence of events, right? So for example, with replication, you can't synthesize new strands of DNA if you haven't split apart the DNA molecule yet, right? If that makes sense. Um, so again, thinking about things in a logical way is really important. Okay, so here's just an example of like a table that I might use as a student to study. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be really simple, just something uh, like this. Okay, and then I wanted to wrap up today's session by giving you guys an opportunity to see what a free response question might look like. Like I said before, uh, College Board has not released like the format of the free response questions that you're going to get. They also haven't released like what kind of free response question you're going to get. Um, if I had to bet, I think they'd give you one long free response question that was database and then maybe one shorter free response question that might look something like this. Um, so this particular free response question says, describe the process of DNA replication, explain the role of enzymes in the process, and explain the differences between leading strand synthesis and lagging strand synthesis. So you'll notice that if you just went through that like checklist of objectives that we just went through together, you could kind of answer this question with no problem at all, right? Um, I think that it's important to organize your answer in a logical way. And I say you should just use the way that the question is written to help you organize yourself, if that makes sense. So here I'm seeing like three logical paragraphs, right? So the first logical paragraph is describe the process of DNA replication. Okay, that's gonna be my first paragraph. My second paragraph is going to be explaining the role of enzymes in the process. And then the last sort of um, paragraph is going to be explaining the difference between leading and lagging strand. Um, I wanted to put these up in case any of you didn't make the last chat. Um, so don't forget the big four ideas. So free response questions often test your understanding. This is definitely one of the four big ideas because it's talking about heredity, right? And it's also talking about that last big idea, which is how biological systems interact with each other, right? 
Um, answer the question, don't go off on tangents. They're asking you about replication, enzymes, and leading versus lagging strand. So you shouldn't be like using this as an opportunity to talk about, uh, I don't know, mitosis, right? Um, keep it on task. For this particular question, you don't really have to think quantitatively because there's no data set. Um, using specific examples, uh, I guess specific examples of the enzymes would be important here. I think for these types of questions where they ask you to describe a process, this is gonna be the most important tip for you to make sure you're using vocabulary. Um, so like I said in the last chat, if you haven't done this already, what I would do as one of your first study, uh, study tasks is go through um, unit by unit and sort of come up with a list of the key vocabulary words that you would want to be able to use in a free response question because the test graders um, will reward you for that, right? Like they're reading probably what, tens of thousands of exams. And so the answers that will stand out to them are gonna be the ones that use the key vocabulary words. Okay, so like I said, I would take this particular free response question piece by piece. The first piece says to describe the process of replication in eukaryotes. Um, so, you know, keeping it really simple here, I'm saying that it's happen happening semi-conservatively. I'm describing what that means. And I'm also saying like, well, why it's used, right? So it's, it's to prepare a cell for division, right? The second sort of piece of the question asks to explain the role of enzymes. Um, I know some students find it useful to like underline them as they go. So if you wanted to do that, you could. Um, so I just started with like a topic sentence of, okay, enzymes mediate DNA replication. And then I talk about what we just discussed. I'm not gonna read this to you, um, but you can sort of see the level of detail that you would want to be able to achieve in a free response question. Any questions on this second piece of my free response? Okay. And then the last part of the free response, I think is the most complicated part, right? So uh, the differences between leading and lagging strand synthesis, the main thing you need to address here is that leading strand synthesis will be continuous and lagging strand synthesis will be discontinuous. Um, I don't even think you need to use the phrase Okazaki fragment, although I'm sure if you use it, it like shows the readers that you really know what's going on. Um, and then including, you'll notice here, I include directionality as a big component. Um, so make sure that you show that you understand that the reason we have leading and lagging strand is because of the directionality of DNA polymerase. Okie dokie. Um, so that's our session today. I did want to kind of keep it brief because I know last time I went like almost an hour long and it just seemed like a lot. I know people are going through a lot right now and school is kind of weird for you guys. Um, so I did just want to do one topic and I think from here on out, I'm going to sort of look at the questions and focus on one topic that seems to be a recurring theme. Um, like I said earlier in the discussion, definitely check College Board's website tomorrow. We're expecting them to make some big announcements about this spring's exams. Um, and then if you have any feedback for us, you can message us on Instagram. Our tag is DNA underscore learning underscore center. Um, you could also feel free to email me. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought about today's session. Thank you so much and good luck on your AP exam.